I have received notice from the Minister for Communities that he wishes to make a statement. Minister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I wish to make a statement to the Assembly in respect of the extension of my department's urban regeneration and community development powers to local government. Over the last year, we have seen real change in local government. The 11 new councils have been established and a range of additional functions and powers have been transferred from central government to them. The aim of the transfer of such key functions as planning, local economic development and local tourism, coupled with the new responsibility for community planning, was to allow councils to take the lead in reshaping and building their communities. As members will be aware, it was also the intention of the Executive to extend to district councils the Department for Social Development statutory powers for urban regeneration and community development, but this was unable to progress within the mandate of the last Assembly. It was also recognised that the new Department for Communities would have responsibility for a much wider range of functions than the Department for Social Development and it would be better to assimilate the various new functions into the new department before deciding if and when some of these responsibilities would be best delivered at a local level. I have now completed six months as Communities Minister. I have spent a lot of that time on the ground speaking and listening to the people who use my department services and those who receive its funding, and to elected representatives and community activists. I have seen at first hand the transformative impact that regeneration projects can have on our town and city centres and the contribution they can make to enhancing the shared space and vibrancy of our communities. And I have seen that irrespective of where legislative responsibility lies, local government plays a huge role in ensuring the successful implementation of our regeneration programmes. Whether this is in Belfast or Londonderry, Lisburn, Armagh or Newry, or in our important towns across Northern Ireland, for example in Enniskillen, Dungannon, Ballymena and Bangor, a key feature of all of this work has been the level of collaborative working that has been achieved between local councils and my department. This is exactly the type of cross-boundary working that is needed under our new programme for government. The programme for government sets out an entirely new context for the delivery of our services, including the way in which we address poverty and disadvantage, and the way that we use our statutory powers to drive economic growth and lever new investment to benefit everybody in this society. The key message from the Executive is that we all, whether in central government, local government or outside government, must ensure we work in a joined-up way across departmental, organisational and sectoral boundaries, and that we must use all our resources and skills to, de to deliver lasting change. It is my assessment, therefore, that the new context calls for a new direction of travel. I want my department to be at the forefront of that change, using all of the powers and resources at its disposal to achieve the outcomes and the ambition the Executive has for our society as set out in the programme for government. This isn't the time to tinker with who is responsible for what or to concern ourselves with the splitting up of the regeneration budget. Rather, it is the time for all the stakeholders to work together to maximise our joint effect and achieve positive change in the issues that have bedeviled this society for too long. So I am announcing today that I do not intend to bring forward proposals to extend my department's urban regeneration and community development powers to local government during this mandate. Rather, I want to see both central and local government operating within our respective existing legislative, community planning and resource, resource frameworks, working with other stakeholders, whether in the community or private sectors, to maximise the impact that we can make together. This is not simply about improving our public realm and increasing our shared space. It is about creating more vibrant places with more employment opportunities and better housing, addressing poverty and improving the quality of people's lives. I also want to explore whether there is a case for extending our regeneration activities to settlements of less than 5,000 people. There are many small settlements which serve the same role in the community as larger places, but which, because of our current policy to restrict access to town centre regeneration funding to towns with populations above 5,000, do not directly benefit 
from the investment in the enhancement of public and shared space available to their larger neighbours. A change to, or indeed the removal of the population threshold, could open up new opportunities to lever in much greater investment, including that from the private sector and local government, to new areas, producing new employment opportunities by, for example, exploiting social clauses. This proposal also offers the scope for enhanced collaboration and cross-government working with the Department for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs and the Department for Infrastructure. I have therefore asked my officials to review the current population thresholds and consider options for extending my department's physical regeneration programme, public realm schemes, development grants and revitalisation activity to projects which promote the vibrancy and vitality of smaller settlements which currently are designated as rural, but which provide retail services and employment opportunities equivalent to more populous ones. This would ensure that citizens living, socialising and availing of services in smaller settlements have access to the same benefits of public space developments as their counterparts in larger conurbations. In all of this, I want to emphasise the essential involvement of colleagues in local government. We already have many fine examples of really good public realm improvement, which has resulted from the combined efforts of local government and my department. Nothing I have said today will change that. On the contrary, I want to see more of that type of collaborative work, where each sector exploits its strengths and authority to maximise the benefits and reach of our public realm programmes. And finally, I want to set out my intentions with regard to the Neighbourhood Renewal Programme. Neighbourhood Renewal was a 10-year strategy, launched in 2003 to deal with the circumstances at that time. There has been investment of almost £280 million since its inception in 2003. The programme has had many successes in helping to nurture community development and in improving the physical fabric, facilities and environment of many of our most deprived areas. And there have been significant improvements across a number of social and economic indicators during the lifetime of the existing strategy. The programme has been subject to both interim and final evaluations. These studies reported that whilst there has been some narrowing of the gap between the neighbourhood renewal areas and the rest of Northern Ireland on a range of the social and economic outcome indicators, the areas remain some way behind when compared to the rest of the country. Neighbourhood renewal has had notable success in community development outcomes. It has laid many of the foundations necessary for ensuring that communities are able to engage in community planning with councils. It has instilled a sense of pride amongst residents in their areas and encouraged high levels of community participation in the development of action plans and in the interventions which have flowed from these. The strategy also had many demonstrable uh, successes in relation to physical and environmental improvements with ample evidence of the benefits accrued through neighbourhood renewal capital investment. Examples include sports facilities, childcare facilities, community centres, business units and play parks. But we have to recognise that things have moved on. There is a different context now. The programme for government places responsibilities on us to focus our efforts on things that make a difference and to challenge ourselves to find better ways of making a positive impact on the outcomes it sets out to achieve. So given where we are and in the context of the achievements of the programme over the last 13 years, I wish to announce today that it is my intention to review the current strategies for tackling deprivation with a view to replacing them with a programme that will be more closely aligned to support the delivery of the new programme for government outcomes. It is in all our interests to see if we can design a programme which will have a greater impact on the intractable social and economic barriers which limit life chances for so many in our community. In that way, we can better uh, be assured about the effectiveness of our interventions to address poverty and deprivation and to improve the lives of people facing barriers to participation in the economy and in the cultural and social life of Northern Ireland. It will be important to ensure that any new programme builds on and does not lose the real benefits of the existing programme. I will also wish to consult stakeholders in the way forward as proposals are being developed and their impact assessed. The current neighbourhood renewal strategy has provided many good news stories across all of the areas that have participated in the programme, and in acknowledging these successes, I want to record my gratitude to all involved. 
I want to conclude by giving an assurance that there will be no sudden change to the delivery of the Neighbourhood Renewal Programme. This will remain in place until the review is complete, and I believe that this is a process that will take 18 months to two years to complete. The development of proposals will be informed by widespread consultation. I particularly want to ask those who have been involved in the neighbourhood renewal process to bring their experience and knowledge to these discussions with my department as we take this work forward. In closing, Mr Deputy Speaker, my statement today brings much needed clarity to an issue in which there is huge interest across Northern Ireland. It sets out an inclusive way forward which will allow us to exploit the strengths of both central and local government. But more than that, it provides an opportunity through collective effort to extend the reach of our programmes so that more of our constituents can better benefit from our interventions. The new programme for government signals a new way of working, a renewed focus on outcomes which requires us to think differently and to challenge the way we do things. This is an important step on that journey, and I look forward to the outcome. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Adam, sir, Kaihala and Kaushja, Colum Eastwood. I call the chair of the committee, Colum Eastwood. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the, the minister for his statement? I have to say that uh, there will be much disappointment uh, at the announcement that the regeneration powers won't be transferred uh, to councils. Can I also say, minister, that there will be new uncertainty uh, injected into community groups uh, around the north uh, as a result of the announcement on neighbourhood renewal? Uh, does the Minister accept that, given uh, Brexit and all the uncertainty that is out there in the funding environment for those groups, that this does inject a new level of uncertainty? And can he guarantee uh, that, going forward after his 18-month uh, review, that money and funding will be given to groups on the basis of objective need and that we are not looking at creating uh, another SIF? Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Well, I reject the assertion that this is going to be met with disappointment, quite the opposite. Uh, I believe there may be some uh, with their own interests who may be disappointed, but I believe those uh, who share the common goal of improving uh, our town centres, of tackling areas around deprivation uh, and poverty will recognise this is a real opportunity uh, that I have outlined, that this is a way in which we can come together, look at the outcomes that we want to achieve and how best that we can achieve it. Let me be clear. The end user of all of these services don't differentiate between the ratepayer and the council delivering it, the taxpayer and Stormont delivering it. They want it delivered, and they want it delivered in the most effective and efficient way possible. And I believe the way in which I've outlined a process that I'm now going to take forward will be able to deliver that, and those who will benefit will be thankful for having that service being delivered. Let me assure the member and members of the House, as I did during the statement, the huge value that I have on the work that Neighbourhood Renewal has carried out and my commitment that as part of this process there will be widespread consultation around this, that Re Neighbourhood Renewal will continue until that process concludes. But the end goal in all of this is to make sure that we can tackle poverty, deprivation in the communities that need to have that addressed. And that's the way that we'll take it forward in that inclusive manner that I hope everybody will recognise and will come to the table and take part in a genuine commitment to address all of the issues that I believe we share the end goal that we want to achieve in. I call Adrian McQuillan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for a statement here this afternoon and, and do welcome it. Given the emphasis, Minister, that you've put on the new programme for government, what PFC outcome will you, the Department be aligning its regeneration activities to? Well, obviously, I've mentioned, Mr Deputy Speaker, in the, the statement of the House about the new programme for government, and within that, the indicators that my department leads on, and then there's others that this department will be contributing to. Uh, of those that the department leads on, uh, PFG 19, reducing poverty, PFG 32, increase the economic opportunities for our most deprived communities, and PFG 42, to increase the quality of life for people with disabilities are good examples. And we're also contributing to other areas, like, for example, uh, PFG 31, increased shared space, which is the responsibility primarily of the Executive Office, and PFG 30, to improve our attractiveness as a destination for the Department for the Economy. So where I have direct responsibility and where I have responsibility to support other departments in achieving these indicators, it is vital that we have all of the tools at our disposal to do that. 
and that's why we need to take the step that I've taken today, that this department will be able to have those tools available to it to really drive forward in terms of tackling these issues that the programme for government is highlighting. Madam Chair, Carolyn Nicholan. I call Carolyn Nicholan. last can call you. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. As some will no doubt be disappointed that functions will not be transferred to local government, can I ask the Minister to reconfirm? He said it in a statement, but to reconfirm that I first of all welcome his commitment to neighbourhood renewal. That there will be a continuation for 18 months to two years while this review is going on. But can he confirm that as part of any review, it will be done on the basis? of tackling poverty and deprivation. It will also look at the role of other bodies and agencies to ensure that they too have a part in the delivery of any new neighbourhood renewal programme, and that the review will be built on objective need rather than reviews in the past that were, in my opinion, were as a result of political venting, not under your watch. Well, I'm happy to give that assurance to the member uh, that this is something that we need to ensure all of the stakeholders feel very much a part of. Uh, that we collectively recognise uh, the needs that exist and how best that we want to achieve that. Uh, and so neighbourhood renewal plays a very significant role in all of that. Certainly in my conversations uh, with a number of councillors, they were keen to have uh, the regeneration powers in terms of public realm, environmental improvement schemes, revitalisation. But there certainly was a concern from a number of councillors about having the neighbourhood renewal functions transferred to local government, uh, and there wasn't consensus in local government uh, around this issue when I've been speaking uh, to a number of councillors on this particular issue. So this is an opportunity, uh, members, for us to be able to tackle these issues, for my department to take the lead on it. I'm a minister who wants to be held to account, who recognises the challenges that exist and wants to have that responsibility of leading on all of this change on behalf of the executive through the programme for government. And for me to do that, we need to have the tools at our disposal within this department to do it. And members here in this House will rightly be able to hold me account for the actions that I take. I call uh, Andy Allen. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement. Minister, would you not agree that this decision goes against the ethos of the local government reform, and indeed which regeneration power, the, the devolvement of that to local councils was a central element? And indeed, is this an aspect of government retaining power for the sake of holding power? Minister, can you advise perhaps where this leaves uh, community planning? Well, as I indicated in the statement, uh, there's a new context in terms of the way in which the executive departments uh, have been reconfigured. This department is the biggest department in the executive, which, uh, with a range of functions now within its responsibility. Uh, and having considered those responsibilities that now exist, having considered the way in which the programme for government is changing how it wants to deliver uh, government with a, the outcomes-based approach, well, then that's set the context for having to consider this issue, and so I don't see it in, in the narrative that the, the member has outlined. Community planning, uh, my department is involved in the community planning role. It's involved in subcommittees within community planning uh, and will continue very much to be a part of that. Uh, I made it clear in the statement that local government uh, has its strengths, uh, and we have uh, partnered with local government on a wide range of areas. Uh, we have funded master plans. We have then uh, had councils lead uh, in terms of the contracts when it comes to public realm work being carried out. Uh, and that has worked very well, and that will continue uh, to be the case. And I know that local government uh, will recognise uh, the opportunities that will exist for this department to tackle a wide range of areas. Uh, and I know that they will, in me as minister, find someone who wants to very much partner with local government, recognising uh, the skills that the local government have when it comes to addressing these issues. I call Naomi Long. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. One key aspect of the transfer of regeneration powers was to be able to use comprehensive development and land assembly powers alongside planning and economic development responsibilities and then co-invest in those schemes. Developers have said clearly what they want from local councils is a one-stop shop so that they're actually able to regenerate major sites. Is this not simply the hallmark of an executive that is a control freakery? Um, around the executive, where the, the distribution of power, allowing other people to take a lead on things, is, is sneered at. Um, and in fact, is it not the case that local government actually were the people who lobbied for these powers to be devolved? 
Well, no, I don't accept uh, the assertion about the control freakery comment. And I think this department, uh, in its previous role in DSD, uh, has been able to use those powers to assemble land so for, for development to take place, not least uh, when it comes to some of the major uh, retail centres that now exist in Belfast city centre. So th there should be no conflict uh, in terms of being able to progress all of those matters when it comes to the assembling of land. I, I will do that uh, where the case is put forward to do that. But I, I point out to the member, in terms of uh, the, my department holding on to this power and not passing it on to local government, it is the two executive parties who also make up the majority across local government. So it, it, it can't be the case uh, of holding power away from local government whenever and transferring it to local government. It will be the two executive parties who control the majority of all of those local government authorities. So members need to, members need to move away. Me members need to move away from that mentality and, and recognise it's about delivering the service. And ultimately, as I said in the, in the earlier comments, the public don't differentiate between local government, central government. All they want is the service delivered and their areas improved. And through this approach, we will do it in the most efficient and effective way possible. I call Christopher Stolford. Speaker, uh, can I welcome the Minister's statement because it does provide much needed clarity. This is an issue that has been running for a long time in local government. The Minister will be aware that different councils were at different levels of preparedness for the planned transfer of powers. I just wonder, under this announcement that has been made, is there scope for tailored cooperation between different councils who were at different levels of preparedness? going forward to deliver, as the Minister has said, the services that all of our people want? Deputy Speaker, very much so. Uh, and that has been the approach uh, that I have taken in office, uh, where local government come to me, they outline what their plans are, and they ask if we can partner with them. Uh, and whenever that request has came, they have always had a very sympathetic hearing, and we have then developed those relationships, uh, and we have been able to partner with local government, not least in uh, where the member represents in, with Belfast uh, City Council at a strategic level, the Belfast Regeneration Direct Directorate has formally adop adopted the Belfast City Council's City Centre Regeneration and Investment Strategy. Uh, again, throughout the country, the, regenerational, uh, the Regional Regeneration Office has worked with councils to produce master plans for our towns and cities. At a project level, the public realm schemes have all been developed in partnership with local councils, and often the councils lead on the delivery of those projects. Through neighbourhood renewal funding, the department has delivered again many projects in partnership with local councils. In Londonderry, for example, two play parks were delivered in the past year, and in the interface areas of Irish Street and Top of the Hill, uh, both I was able to visit earlier in the year during the summer, and that demonstrates again the benefits of partnership working with councils. And so I very much want to work with local government. Uh, I know local government want to work with me. Uh, and when we come in the spirit of collaboration, wanting to address the same area, areas that we recognise that need to be addressed, then we will be able to collectively achieve that desired outcome. Kieran, sir, Michelle Gildenew. I call Michelle Gildenew. Um, I'd like to thank the Minister for his statement today and um, I'm delighted that he is considering lowering. Hopefully he'll remove the threshold for public realm investment in smaller towns and villages because I think it was um, very regrettable that the threshold was introduced by a previous DSD minister and it has really been a disadvantage to, to, many, to our many small towns and villages. The Minister has outlined some of the things that he would um, see as being part of that, childcare, play facilities, etc. The time scale that the Minister has set down in terms of 18 months to two years, is there an opportunity for the Department to, um, to, to engage with smaller towns and villages about what they would see, or do they have to wait to the end of that process for a decision on the threshold? Well, we, we've decoupled the, the two issues around neighbourhood renewal and the issue around the threshold uh, to do with how we would uh, use our urban regeneration powers around public realm and, and that type of work. Uh, and so uh, it, it will not be held back in respect of looking at the neighbourhood renewal aspect. Um, so once we have a, a review around that and we can consider how we would do that, I hope to be in a position to announce if the threshold is lowered, what it is lowered to, or indeed if there should be a threshold at all. Um, because I, I know uh, the valuable 
uh, contribution that our smaller towns and villages do carry out uh, and very much are the centre of uh, the rural communities hub uh, and it's important that they get investment as well and that it's not just the bigger towns and cities that get that investment uh, and so I would hope to be in a position to announce what the threshold if it is lowered or if it's removed altogether much sooner than the neighbourhood renewal review which will take around 18 months to two years. I call Carla Lockhart. Thank you, and can I thank the Minister for his statement. The public, I believe, don't mind who does the work as long as it gets done. Um, so, As an MLA for a constituency with many small towns and villages such as Dollingstown, Waringstown, St. Patrick and Scarva, can I ask the Minister how will his department determine what small settlements will benefit from public realm schemes? I think the member fitted in all of them within the upper band constituency <laughs> um, uh, and has had me out at a number of them uh, and making the point to me about how investment in these villages um, need, needs to be carried out uh, and not just solely in our larger towns and cities. But currently the settlement classification is determined um, around in respect of public realm works based upon solely uh, population and that means to date, it's only those settlements where the populations of 5,000 and over um, get the investment, and therefore below that it is denied uh, in terms of the department's regeneration programmes. So there has been some criticism of that approach in some quarters, and we want to explore if a case can be made for smaller settlements based on other criteria that would take in, for example, the service provision uh, that exists within these smaller uh, towns and villages. I call Philip Smith. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I, if the public don't care who does what, then it begs the question, why have devolution at all? But uh, the Minister will, I hope, be aware of correspondence I've uh, sent to him seeking feedback on my private member's bill that proposes devolving powers to the local government, including regeneration powers. As he is, I believe, now responding on behalf of the executive, but has yet to do so, can I assume that his statement today indicates his lack of support? I think the, the member has been very astute in respect of uh, understanding what the ministerial statement has outlined in respect of the regeneration powers aspect of it. Um, that, that is not to say uh, that there are not other functions which the executive may wish to consider that could go to local government that may be more appropriate for local government to deal with. Uh, as the member will know, I chair the regional partnership panel. Uh, on behalf of the executive, where I meet formally with the 11 representatives uh, of the local authorities, uh, and we've extended that out now to include the chief executives, and that uh, allows that direct uh, connection between local government and Stormont, uh, where we are able to engage on these issues, uh, and the councils are able to have input into that. We can update local government, uh, and it is a framework that I believe. Uh, can be doing more than what it has been able to achieve so far. And I indicated that at our last re regional partnership panel meeting, uh, that this is something that I very much recognised as the, the key uh, connection between local government and the executive. Uh, and that will be the vehicle in which we will want to have more detailed engagement with local authorities. But um, in respect of the, the member's request that has come into my department, uh, he will get a formal notification in respect of that. But the statement is very clear today. Uh, this department uh, is best placed to deliver on the regeneration powers th that exist. Here I'm Sir Fran McCann. I call Fran McCann. Um, the last count, um, I would ask, uh, the, the, I thank the Minister for his statement today. And I think one of the things that has happened over a lengthy period of time is, that, is people's belief that the concept of neighbourhood renewal was excellent. I think the, the delivery by our departments and sometimes our statutory bodies uh, fell down and uh, communities felt it. Uh, but uh, can the Minister give an assurance that local government will still have the opportunity to deliver regeneration programmes and projects uh, with the department uh, just because these functions will not be transferred to local government? Yeah, I can give that commitment to the member. Um, local government uh, are able to invest. Uh, obviously, they have greater powers when it comes to uh, taking forward on a whole range of issues what they want uh, to take forward. Uh, I'm working with my department, where local government want to make investment around the regeneration of their communities and their areas, they are able to do that. Uh, and certainly, uh, I would be supportive of those, those councils who want to take forward projects 
uh, and I'll very happily partner with them as well. Uh, but where there are single issue type uh, areas where they want to take forward regeneration work, local government is able to do that. Aram Sir Nicola Mallon, I call Nicola Mallon. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister, could he perhaps explain the lack of coherence and consistency coming from this executive when we have a finance minister making statements about the need to regenerate our towns, our cities, our communities and High Street, and then a Minister for Communities who today is announcing that the tools to make that happen, the transfer of uh, re regeneration and community development powers to local councils, isn't going to happen? Well, the, the member, I'm sure, has been listening carefully to both the Minister for Finance and indeed to my ministerial statement, and I don't think anywhere you will see uh, a contradiction in what is being said. And indeed, in my own statement, I've made it very clear how much I value the work that local government uh, does carry out, how much I want to work with them in collaboration in the way that we have been able uh, to work with local government on a range of issues. And local authorities have been with me outlining programmes that they would like this department to support. Uh, and I will very much work with local government in respect of taking forward all of the programmes that they want to do um, within the responsibilities that I have in my department. Um, so local government can be re reassured today. It provides clarity around this particular issue because it has been something that local authorities have talked about at length. Uh, it's an issue that uh, they have asked me to give clarity on, often with a decision one way or the other is exactly what they want. Uh, and then they know the framework that they're operating in and we can collectively move forward because both local government and the executive are committed to achieving the same end objectives and that is to regenerate our communities, to improve our town and city centres and to tackle the poverty and deprivation which members spoke about at length yesterday uh, during the debate that the two parties brought forward. And uh, this is a, a way in which I have demonstrated my commitment uh, that I want to tackle the issues that members raised during the debate yesterday. I call Stephen Farray. Speaker, this really is a, a kick in the teeth for local government. The hard-working and indeed uh, free-thinking councillors from all political parties, the community planning process, a bottom-up process, and indeed the RPA uh, itself. But can I ask the, the Minister to comment specifically on the implications this has for ongoing development work the councils are taking forward that has been predicated on the transfer of regeneration powers and particularly have in mind the, the Queen's Parade development in my own hometown of Bangor that was very much based upon that this transfer happening and indeed other work has now got to be done to accommodate this change of course from the department. Well, the this is very much a, a vote of confidence in local government and their ability to partner with the executive. Uh, and I know local government are going to welcome that, that I have made it very clear that I want to work in collaboration with the 11 councils uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and we will be together able to maximise the strengths that each of us have in terms of the executive and local government, recognising that both have different strengths and abilities to achieve uh, the end objectives that we all want to address. Um, so this is very much an opportunity for us now to move on, recognising the framework that we're going to be operating in, uh, and collectively put our shoulder to the, to the wheel, and we will be able to address these issues. So councils will be able to continue uh, doing their work that they have been doing and developing their plans and assessing how uh, they want to regenerate uh, the towns and cities and villages. And my department will very much play a full role in that process in making sure that those plans become a reality. Aram, Sir Alex Atwood. I call Alex Atwood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I make it very clear that we in these benches, unlike some others nearby, take with a big pinch of salt uh, the DUP's commitment uh, to neighbourhood renewal and the principles that have underpinned that strategy for many a long year? A huge, big pinch of salt. And we'll be watching you, Minister, very closely in that regard. Laugh the way you do. There's a lot of people who won't have smiles on their faces today. Can I ask the Minister, does he not accept that the very essence of the transfer of powers to local councils was that if they took planning and development powers, then in due course would follow the resources and the ability to do more than just make plans? Do you not accept that what you have done today has run a coach on horses? through local government reorganisation and the legislation of this House, whereby the deal with local councils has been openly and callously breached by you by your statement to the House today. 
I knew Mr. Atwood always had his eye on me, uh, so I look forward to ha having a, a, a watchful eye on the activities that I uh, carry out. Um, in respect of the, the issues that the member has raised, I have been in a number of areas now where neighbourhood renewal has transformed areas. I was in Ballymena, uh, where I was able to go into areas uh, and see at first hand the important work that's been carried out. I've been in areas of East Belfast, I've been in areas of North Belfast, uh, where neighbourhood renewal has transformed uh, communities. But it was a scheme that was created in 2003. £280 million has been spent on it. Um, if the member is seriously suggesting that when you develop a scheme that, that you don't then look at how has it delivered against the objectives that were then set, where are, do we as a society now want to look at addressing the needs that exist around tackling poverty and deprivation and making sure that all of the government's schemes align to addressing that? I think that would be a foolish approach to take uh, in the way in which government uh, operates. And I point out, as I did in the statement, there were numerous attempts in the last mandate to introduce this, and there wasn't consensus. When I have been out with local government, there have been local government authorities, councillors, saying to me, we would like some of the regeneration powers, but don't give us neighbourhood renewal because that's a very difficult one to manage. We, we don't want to have that. So there hasn't been consensus in local government as well. So uh, in the absence of that consensus and recognising the new way in which uh, the programme for government is being delivered, the way in which this department has now brought together a range of its responsibilities, the biggest now in the executive. It's in that context that I believe the decision that I am taking is the right one to take. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, does he not recognise that councils themselves believe it is folly to charge them with local development plans, community plans and setting out a vision of regeneration for their area only to sweep the powers for master plans, spatial planning uh, from under their feet? Uh, no, I don't, because again, it, it has been councils who have led on uh, creating the master plans, and this department has often funded uh, that, or councils have put in a percentage contribution around revitalisation schemes, around public realm schemes, and so it has been a partnership approach. And so, in the development of the plans that they are carrying out, um, the decision uh, by me to retain these powers within my department in no way will do any harm uh, to the delivery of the plans the councils will be able to, to come up with. And indeed, I believe it will actually ensure that they will be delivered because we will maximise uh, both my department's strengths and local government's strengths uh, to achieve the objectives that we want to address. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I think it's very disappointing news that we're getting today, um, not just for local governments who are always best placed to identify and work on local need, but also for those working at ground level in community development and regeneration who also find it much easier to engage and access their local council than they do departments at this assembly. But I'm um, slightly heartened to hear that the, the Minister is keen to keep engaged um, with those and ask those who have been involved in the, the neighbourhood renewal process to bring their experience and knowledge to the discussions and that uh, there will be no sudden change in the delivery of the programme. But can he give us assurance then that, uh, that these organisations and these people will not have to reprove their need for all over again in order to access any continued funding? Um, or will he be happy? to keep with existing measures that are already used and allow them to continue the great work they do? Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I have met with countless community organisations that my department has provided support to, uh, whether it's through financial resources or help uh, within the, the various offices. I am yet to meet one group who has said to me, Minister, we don't like working with your department. We don't believe it helps us as a community to address the issues in our community. We want councils to deliver this, not one group. However, I was only with a group yesterday. Um, Mr Easton isn't here, and he brought with me an organisation, an umbrella organisation, uh, Arts Development Bureau, uh, that works with, uh, I think it's 11 or possibly nine different community organisations across Northern Ireland. Uh, and uh, they pleaded with me not to pass responsibility to local authorities. They wanted this department uh, to continue to do the work and not to transfer it. And they are people who are working 
at the cold face within our communities because they have an excellent relationship, as they said, with my department. They recognise the work that it has been able to carry out, and they were concerned that this responsibility was going to transfer to local authorities. Uh, and I believe that uh, that was being funded through the Community Investment Fund, and that fund will be staying within this department. And that has provided, I think, reassurance certainly to that organisation on behalf of those local grassroots community organisations. I call Jim Allister. Thank you. When the Minister says that the $280 million spend on, renew on neighbourhood renewal has produced some narrowing of the gap uh, between those areas and the rest of the province, but that they remain some way behind, is the inference of that that despite some good schemes, overall there has been disappointment with the outcomes of neighbourhood renewal? and that it does need fixed? And can he then tell us, has the department done a comparative costing in terms of delivery centrally as opposed to delivery locally through the councils? Well, certainly the delivery, uh, delivering this centrally will allow a consistency of approach across Northern Ireland. Um, it will allow us, uh, in the review, um, to ensure that when we consider how neighbourhood renewal and that $280 million, uh, has rolled out uh, its effectiveness and what changes could be made to make it more effective, uh, what areas that currently don't benefit from neighbourhood renewal should they be benefiting, uh, and uh, having this department responsible for that will allow us uh, to look at that issue rather than breaking those functions up uh, so that you have 11 different approaches to tackling primarily poverty, deprivation and regeneration across uh, the different councils, and I think uh, we will be able to do that. So uh, we recognise that there has been some narrowing of the gap, uh, but it is a scheme that started in 2003, and I think it's timely that we would carry out a review of that um, so that as we seek to address these areas, uh, are we doing it in the most effective way? Uh, and I think it's timely now to carry that out. I call Kelly Armstrong. Deputy Speaker, as the Minister has already said, the public wants services delivered, but I think that today is a very sad day because I think that the public who came out to all of those community planning meetings, providing their input, their ideas as to how they wanted their towns and villages regenerated, have been stomped over. Can I ask the Minister, do you have the support of Nilga? And do you have the support of any single council? Has any single council advocated this change, or are you telling local government what to think? Well, as I indicated, uh, as I've met with councils uh, and recognising the, the excellent work that they have carried out around regeneration, I opened up the Port Stewart public realm works that was carried out. I've been in Carrickfergus uh, for their public realm works that has been uh, completed. Uh, and that has been one where those local authorities have been the lead. They have appointed the contractors. Uh, they have managed that project, and my department has provided, uh, in most cases, the vast majority of that resource. Uh, and they've been able to achieve those uh, outcomes. Uh, but as indicated to, to previous questions, there were those within local authority who didn't want to have neighbourhood renewal. There were councillors who didn't want to have neighbourhood renewal, but they wanted to have regeneration functions. But ultimately, these decisions are taken by the executive and by me as minister in respect of how we seek to address the needs within our society. And I have outlined in the statement uh, the best way to do that is local government and the executive collectively working together to drive forward uh, on these issues. Uh, and again, I'm repeating, the public do not differentiate between the two. They just want to have the service delivered. And my department and I as minister have engaged with a whole range of community organisations. And I don't believe you will find any of those community organisations uh, who will say that they're not getting the support that they need to be getting from this executive. I appreciate that members uh, in the opposition and not opposition but are opposing um, want to use this as an opportunity to, to make a point against the executive, and that's, 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 part, and par that's part and parcel of politics, so that, that's fair enough. I'm not going to criticise that, but if we can lift it above the politics of this chamber and put ourselves out into our communities that we represent, they want us to deliver the service, not to be involved in bickering about who does what. This is the best way, however, to achieve these objectives. Call Jonathan Bell. 
case that for people on the ground, this should be looked upon as a win-win situation. The people who need this are not interested in party political points going across the chamber. They want to see local government and central government uh, working together. And you're absolutely right. Is it not the case that the end user is interested in delivery? They're not really interested so much in the route map as to how they got there, but they're interested in real delivery. And how can we ensure, despite the nonsense of the political points going here today, that we bring the stakeholders along with us and that we see at the end of this process a genuine win-win for both central and local government? Yeah, the, the member makes the point very well uh, that ultimately this is about uh, delivering the services to our community. Uh, and I've outlined how I believe that is best achieved in collaboration, by working together. Uh, it isn't a case of uh, them and us uh, when it comes to local government and the executive. It is about us collectively working together. And councils uh, are well placed through the community planning process to have the statutory framework for engaging with uh, different agencies and indeed the public. And my department has a key role to play in all of that process. And we will be able to bring uh, the the tools at our disposal in this department to achieve the objectives that local government uh, will want to have addressed. Sir Trevor Lund. I call Trevor Lund. Uh, thank you very much, Prince, uh, Deputy Speaker. Just to give the Minister another chance to answer the question that she failed to answer a few moments ago, does he, does he have the support of Nilga in what he's doing? And could he name a council which supports his position? I have met with Nilga, I have met with uh, the NAC, and I should declare an interest, my uh, father is an executive member on Nilga, um, and I have met through the partnership panel process where, uh, in, in all of those occasions, uh, councillors have raised the issue as to uh, the transfer of functions to local government around regeneration, uh, and what they have been saying is they want to have a decision. Yet, I understand that there are those within local authority who wanted to have powers transferred, um, but I have now set out the context in which this decision is based upon. I think I have explained that now um, extensively, and hopefully members will now recognise the decision has been taken. We move on collectively so that we can address the needs that exist within our community. Members, that concludes questions on the statement. <clears throat>